Hello and welcome to Skitty Animates. I'm Skitty and today I'm going to teach you everything you need to know when approaching making walk cycles. And with that out of the way, let's get started. Before we dive into Maya and start blindly animating, it's important to understand the how of what we're doing first. Most people try making walk cycles pretty early on when they're learning animation because it's considered a basic to a degree, but don't feel bad if it turns out looking terrible on your first go or even the fifth. Cycles are hard even for experienced animators, myself included. We always want to start with a foundation, so let's figure out how to create a generic walk cycle as our base and then build on it from there. Usually I advocate for using live action footage as reference, but when building the base foundation for walk cycles, there are plenty of adequate hand-drawn charts online to reference for the key poses. This chart from the Animator Survival Kit, which is personally my favorite animation textbook, and I'll leave a link in the description to where you can grab yourself a copy, is what I like to use as my base reference. So where do we start? Well technically we could start at any of these keyframes since the cycle will always loop back around, but what seems to be the standard, and also what I find the easiest, is to start on the contact position. The order of operations would be starting position, aka the contact, the ending position, aka the next contact, the passing position, down position, then the up position. This structure should feel familiar to you if you animate using the pose to pose method since it's broken down the same way. We're making a starting pose, an ending pose, the main in-between, then a breakdown on either side of the in-between. The contact position we're starting with is the first frame where the foot makes contact with the ground. Think of walking as consistently falling over and catching yourself. In that regard, the contact position is where the body really would start falling if that foot wasn't there to take the energy away. The contact leg is still straight at this point since it hasn't taken the weight of the body from the back foot yet and the back foot's heel is off the ground. Center of gravity, which resides in the pelvis, is center between both feet and the majority of the weight is in the front of the back foot. Whichever leg is forward, we counterbalance by putting the opposite arm forward. Next we make our ending pose, which for a generic cycle should look identical to your starting position except mirrored. Now we can move on to our passing position, the main in-between. This is the pose where the back leg passes to become the front leg and the hips are slightly higher than on the contact position. The newly considered back leg is straight, the knee is locked to support the body weight on its own and the foot is flat. The arms are also about to pass or have just barely passed. As long as you keep the arms in that range, you'll be fine. Next we can move on to the first breakdown pose, the down position. This is where we need to feel the impact of the weight transferring to the new front leg. The contrast between the straight leg on the contact position and the bent leg on the down position is what's going to make or break the weight's believability of your cycle. The lower part of the front leg and the flat foot should make a 90 degree angle, roughly, depending on your rig's proportions, and the arms will be at the widest part of their stride. We go down, arms go up. The back foot is no longer carrying the body's weight, and this is the last frame the toe should be touching the ground. Without any weight, the foot won't have any bend left in the toe since it was a forceful bend driven by the ground. Now let's talk about the final key pose, the up position. This is when your character's hips are up the highest. We've pushed off the back leg, arcing the body up before gravity takes control and drops us back down. Our height raises the planted heel off the ground, and we are the most off balance here. Thank goodness that other leg is going to catch us soon, am I right? The front foot is finishing its drag from the liftoff and is moving to face forward again. Once those five key poses are done, we can make the remaining four poses to bring us back to our starting position. Just repeat your down, pass, up, and contact again, but mirrored to the other leg. Now we have our poses done, so let's talk a bit about timing. Every human on this planet has their own unique walk cycle. Our walk is a defining feature that helps identify each of us. This is how we're able to recognize someone even if they're walking too far away for us to see their face. The general consensus is that we walk on 12s. What makes us unique is the movements themselves. But 12 frames doesn't work well with our five poses. This would leave us with an odd number of frames between each key. So instead, we can animate on 16s, putting three frames in between each key pose. The extra four frames aren't going to make a big difference on impact. But if you're concerned about it, you can always tweak the timing later when we change our generic cycle into a specific one. Looking at these poses, we have the first contact on frame 1, down position on frame 5, passing position on frame 9, up position on frame 13, and the next contact position is on frame 17, not 16. 
This is because when we've animated the whole loop, we need to save the second last frame and delete the end key so we can seamlessly loop back around to our starting position. If we left that key in the cycle, that frame would play twice creating a hitch. So the cycle is on a 16, but the final position will appear on 17. Now let's try to understand how these arcs work. The most important arc in almost any action is the hips, so let's start there. This arc will mostly act like a wave, smoothly bobbing up and down, but if you look closely, the time spent arcing up is slower than the arc back down. This is because of gravity. On the way up, it's your own body driving the action, but as we near the peak of the curve, we allow gravity to take the work away from us, which speeds us up on the way down. Now let's look at the legs and feet. The wave arc on the feet is heavily one-sided, lifting the full way at the back and easing back down towards the front. This arc is exaggerated for the sake of example, so just remember that humans are very lazy. We're only going to raise our feet the necessary amount to not trip. The heel leads the action for the foot. It lifts off first, drags, then makes contact with the ground first. The foot has a bit of a slapping action when it lifts off the ground, followed by the drag. We need to make sure we feel the difference in timing on these actions. Now let's attach the leg to this action. The leg is completely straight on the contact frame, and it's most bent on the passing position. Just like with the foot, there's a difference in timing we need to look out for. A quick impact from the contact to the down position and a gradual straighten for the up position and gradual bend for the other foot's turn on the ground. Think of it like gears rotating but with a slap on the back of it. Now let's look at the arms. The arms work just like a pendulum. A pendulum works by having very few keys on the transition and lots of close together keys on each side. Each key on the sides gets closer together as they go. So if we take that logic and apply it to the arm, all we have to do now is accommodate the bending elbows and the wrist. The elbow reacts with a drag. The arm moves back and the elbow bends trailing behind it. It eventually catches up and straightens on the way back forward. If you want to get extra cartoony, you can break the elbow on the way back. Give it a small bend to drag backwards unnaturally. It will make your arcs look buttery smooth, just make sure it's barely visible so the viewer doesn't think it looks painful. Again, felt not seen. The wrist will also drag, but this time it's the elbow driving the action, and the wrist can naturally bend in both directions. The hands can even move in a figure eight arc if you want to get fancy. Don't forget to also add subtle movements on the fingers. They'll be driven by the wrist. Huh, <sighs> that was a lot to get through. Is everything making sense so far? There's still a lot to learn, but let's jump into Maya and go through it while actually making something. I'm going to focus on posing the hips, legs, and feet before looking at anything else so I can concentrate on these arcs and make sure they're working. When posing out the hips, twist the pelvis to favor the front leg. Your hips are helping you carry the foot forward. Do a pass to sway the hips after you get the up and down movement. The high side of the hips will be on the planted leg. The shoulders in front view will counter this, tilting opposite the hips. What I'm doing here is adding in the five key poses in an exaggerated way so that I can tone it down later and then I'm transferring them to the other side. It's always easier to start exaggerated and then tone it down than it is to have it toned down and try to exaggerate it later. The fastest way to transfer your poses from one foot to the other is to add these as poses in your studio library and then use the mirror function to paste it on the other foot. Once you have your feet in the starting and ending positions and then set the tangents to linear, try not to move your feet in the translate Z while you're posing them. This will cause problems later when you try to actually translate the cycle, as it will make your feet slide. Since the shoulders are going to be doing the opposite action that the hips are doing, the torso is going to act as kind of that transition period where it twists to make the hips and the shoulders work together. The torso's job is also to make sure that the body stays upright. For the most part, we want the torso to be facing forward, but a little bit of a sway from side to side can look nice as well. If at any point you're having difficulty getting your character to be posed the way that you would like them to be, stand up and put your body in the position yourself. It can really help you get the idea that you're trying to get across. You don't necessarily have to record yourself, but just feeling with your own body how that action would work can help you more than you would think. If your character has anything that needs secondary animation, like long hair or cloth, there's a significant delay on these movements. It's best not to worry about these until last, so the body is moving how it should. When the body goes down, hair goes up, and when the body goes up, hair goes down. Cloth and hair is so lightweight that they are more affected by the body's movements than gravity itself. Drop the shoulders on the passing positions, just like the pendulum. The shoulders are basically the anchors for the arm pendulums after all. And remember to tone down the arms once you have that movement working. Arm movement is effort and we are lazy. 
I recommend play blasting often during this process just because Maya can sometimes skip frames which can obfuscate what you're actually looking at. When animating the head movement, don't get fancy with the figure eights here. We only want subtle up and down movement. We're humans, not bobbling chickens. Even though the torso is going to have a bit of a sway on it, try to keep the head with as little rotate X movement as you can. We're always going to try to keep looking forward to where we're going. Once the generic cycle is done, I highly recommend adding it to your studio library plugin so you never have to think about it again, you'll always have your base. Now let's look to make this walk more appropriate for Dana. Feminine characters take shorter steps, feet stay closer together, almost like a protective pose, and the feet are more likely to face inwards. The feet only move just as far around as they have to to clear the other leg. With the hips moving the energy from side to side, this reduces the amount of bounce in the step. Now let's apply the generic walk on David and make him masculine. Masculine walks are the opposite of protective. They have larger steps, feet splayed and further apart from each other, and little to no hip sway, giving the walk a bigger bounce. While making Dana more feminine and David more masculine is a step in the right direction, at this point they're still generic. Their gender, age, health, economic status, confidence level, and most importantly their mood will heavily affect their walks making them look less like applied animations and more like real characters. The simplest way to add a mood to your cycle is through animation layers. To give Dana a sad walk, we can create a sad pose on a layer and blend her into it. Back on the main layer, we can reduce the curves to make her movements more contained, unfocused, and maybe even a bit soupy. Sad characters don't focus on the destination. If we want to give David an angry walk, we would use the same process to make his poses bigger, stronger, and hyper-focused on where he's going. Lastly, but no less important, let's get these cycles moving. If your character has more than one main body control, I recommend using the secondary inner control so you have the freedom of moving the entire action with the main control if need be, but we don't always have that luxury. Grab the control you're using and set a key on frame 1, then move the time slider to the last frame your contact foot is on the ground and move the controller forward, eyeballing to line up the position of the toes the best you can. Next, set the tangents to linear. This control can't have any amount of ease on it or your feet will slide. Lastly, go to your graph editor and hit this button here, post infinity cycle with offset. Now your character will continue walking into infinity. Bye Dana! If you need your character to make turns while they're walking, just attach them to a motion path and adjust the speed that way. And I think that's about everything I could possibly say about walk cycles. Leave a comment below if there's something you didn't understand, like and subscribe if you learned something, links to socials are in the description, and remember to always use a reference.